Welcome to the Third Spiritist Federation of Florida Conference. Mediumship, a human attribute. Please join us in welcoming Dr. Simoings. Well, good afternoon. I am very honored to be here today, and I'm also very humble to be here today. I would like to um, just say a few words before I start. I am also extremely grateful for the Spiritist Federation of Florida for the invitation, and most importantly, for the opportunity to work and to do the study that I did with all my heart and that allow me in first place to, to learn something new and hopefully to bring a little bit more of light to a spirit very much in need of light. So it was a humbling experience and I am really, really grateful for this. I have the difficult task of keeping you awake after lunch. <laughs> and bad news, because when Givaldo was here speaking, we are all in awe, inspired by his energy, his knowledge. When Daniel was here, it's just so easy to be with him because he's such a light guy, and so witty, and so intelligent. And me, my limitations, what I do is I study a lot. So I brought you a study. So please bear with me. Medium, mediumship with Jesus. 2,000 years ago, Jesus was with us. And he knew that we could not understand exactly what he was saying to us at the time. He also knew that it would be necessary for science to come and to explain to us certain laws so we could understand better about the essence of life and the essence of his own teachings. He also knew that we would forget the things that he had to say and that we would misinterpret the things that he had to say and that we would in some way distance ourselves from the teachings and from God. And therefore, he left us with a promise, a promise that is found in the Gospel of John, and it is explained by the spirits in the, by the, spirits in the book, The Gospel According to Spiritism, chapter six, The Consoler. In the promise, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray for my Father, and he will send you another Consoler, that he may remain with you forever, the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But as for you, you will know him, because he will remain with you and will be among you. But the Consoler, who is the Holy Spirit, whom my Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and we will enable you to remember everything that I have said to you. God reveals the truth to humanity in many different ways. 
in all parts of the globe, in different languages, to different missionaries, to different hearts. But the spiritist message, the spiritist philosophy is a revelation of the truth that comes to fulfill Christ's promise. And it does so by explaining to us precisely the questions that were in our initial video, who are we? Where do we come from and where are we going? And most importantly, why do we struggle so much? What are the reasons for all the pains and sufferings that we undergo in this lifetime? Spiritism also brings the consolation, brings the clarity in first place, explaining to us our origin and our essence and also bring light over some of Jesus' teachings that we didn't quite understand at the time. Teachings such as the plurality of existence, of the idea of reincarnation. But it brings the consolation. Because beyond telling us about who we are, it tells us that we are all children of God, we are all divine beings, with one destination, no matter how lost we might feel in one or another day of our lives, our destination is the light. And so Spiritism lifts the veil that was purposely left over certain mysteries. And that Alain Kardec, in the book, What is Spiritism, states, lifting the veil aids the development of our intelligence and enlarges our range of ideas by enabling us to penetrate the laws of nature more deeply. Since the spirit world exists by virtue of one of such laws of nature, spiritism enables us to know about it. It teaches us the influence that the invisible world exerts on the visible world and the connections between the two in the same way that astronomy teaches us the connections between the stars and the earth. So, spiritism lifts the veils and teaches us about a spiritual reality. It teaches us that matter is not only what we see, but it exists in different levels of vibrations, in different dimensions. It teaches us that we are all immersed in what's called the breath of God, or the universal cosmic fluid, where our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions build outside of us the environment, the realities that lie within our hearts. And it teaches us that there are two humanities, one inside the physical body and one outside of the physical body. Or perhaps we shouldn't say that. We should say that there is one humanity in two different states of vibration. And these humanities are not disconnected. On the contrary, these humanities are very much connected, influencing one another, talking to one another at all times. This relationship is described in the book Theory of Mediumship, where it reads, Spiritism teaches us about the spiritual nature of human beings, showing its interexistential reality. It teaches us that human beings need successive stages in the material realm for their evolution. The spirit, therefore, lives in two existential realms, while in the material realm, interacts with the spiritual world, and while out of the body, it remains linked to the material world. Human beings are spiritual beings and interexistent beings, meaning that there is a permanent and active intercommunication and interaction between incarnate and discarnate, thanks to a natural faculty of all human beings called mediumship. So I am assuming that the majority of us is not here to be convinced that we can talk to the spirits and they can talk to us or that we are immortal beings. So our purpose in this talk is to tell you what makes mediumship under the light of spiritism 
different than the mediumship outside of spiritism because mediumship is everywhere. It's practiced in many different ways. But what it is, what is it? The understanding of the spiritist philosophy and the instructions given to us by the spirits in how we should use mediumship in our lives. We went to the book, The Consoler by Emmanuel. At the very end, we're gonna use the definition of Emmanuel in this book. Emmanuel says, mediumship is the light that would be poured all over the flesh. The light that was promised by the divine master to take place at the time of the consoler, currently in course on earth. If the mediumistic mission has its obstacle and painful struggles, it is one of the most beautiful opportunities of progress and redemption given to God to its frail creatures. Being the light that shines in the flesh, mediumship is an attribute of the spirit patrimony of the immortal soul. It is an element that renews the moral position of the terrestrial creature, enriching all its values related to the acquisition of virtues and intelligence whenever linked to the principles of the gospel in its earthly trajectory. So let's go back to the beginning. Mediumship is the light that would be poured all over the flesh. And he refers precisely to the promise made by Jesus. Jesus said, and I love what Givaldo said earlier today, that he was not going to send us the problem solver of our lives, but the consoler that will bring us consolation. So in the 1800s, the gates, the windows of heaven opened up, and the voices of the spirits were heard everywhere. It was the light pouring all over the flesh. They were coming to tell us, hey you, we are here. Life goes on, it does not end with the death of the physical body. We are alive. And they had to speak loud to call our attention, and so they lift tables, and they made noise, precisely because at that time, it was important for us to become aware of their existence. But Emmanuel, in another book called Field of Mediumship, he says to us that mediumship nowadays has a different mission. It is no longer the tool to call our attention over the existence of the spirits because most of us know about that. So the role of mediumship in our lives today is to, is to help us in our moral needs. It's in the very beginning of this book. And Emmanuel calls our attention to the fact that the first 100 of spiritism Spiritists have observed, the humanity has observed, the incredible advances of science, of the intelligence, but also we have all witnessed together the increased number of wars, of violence, of destruction, of abortions, of suicides, of what the so-called perfect crimes with the perversion of the human intelligence and also a very scary increased number in mental diseases, mental disorders that have as the base the obsessive process. It is for this humanity, Emmanuel states, the mediumship is given as one of the most beautiful opportunities of progress and redemption. So mediumship is given to a humanity that has had enough intelligence to go out and explore the beauties of the universe, but to a humanity that a lot of times is unable to name a feeling. To a humanity that becomes indifferent so many times 
to the pain of others, and to a humanity that make wars in relationships, in their daily lives, to this humanity, God in its mercifulness says here, you need one more tool for your redemption, and this tool is called mediumship. And we are going to understand how that is, but before that, let me just make one thing clear. We have a study group, and I ask my students or my friends, my teachers, that's a better term, to tell me what was the idea about mediumship. And one of them said to me, I think mediums are gifted people with a very special mission. And I will tell you that those are rare. And in mediumship, the idea, in spiritism, the idea is this, is a tool of rede redemption for souls compromised with the law. God's concession to lift the human soul, a divine opportunity for the rehabilitation and reharmonization of the soul. With that, we move forward. And we're gonna learn with Emmanuel because Emmanuel, as a master, as a teacher that he is, he is excellent in making things very simple for us to understand. Also in the book, The Consoler, Emmanuel brings the idea of mediumship comparing the mediumistic attributes to the talents of the gospel. That's a very important concept. So in the gospel, the passage from Jesus, there is the, the master who called the servants and the master is about to leave in a, on a trip. And so he says, I want to give you these talents, the currency of the time, and I want you to multiply the talents, which both of the servants did, and one of the servants buried the talent. That is precisely what mediumship is to us. It's a talent that is given to us by God. Not something that we went into a store and purchase, not something that we went into a university to acquire the faculty, per se, but something that was given to us by God, a talent that does not belong to us, but to our Father. In Emmanuel, moving on with Emmanuel, now in a different book, a book by Martins Peralva, in the very beginning, there is a page called Word of the Author, and in there, Emmanuel talks about mediumship using the image of the waterfall. When we look to a waterfall, we are often in awe with the strength, with the power, with the beauty of the waterfall. But it is only through the work of engineering, bringing discipline to its force, that it becomes the base for increased benefits, such as the production of light. So we may all have medium sheep. We all are mediums, as we have already learned today. And that is a potential that we have within ourselves but it takes an engineer, and the engineer is the spirit, is our mind, is our will, to channel it, to give this force guidance and direction so we can become light in us and in our paths. And it's again Emmanuel, because he's amazing, the spiritual mentor. In the book, Field of Mediumship, chapter 16, Emmanuel says, mediumship, belonging to all human beings, can be compared to a common vision. There is no histological difference between the eyes of someone who does not know how to read, of someone who does not like to read, of someone who finds pleasure in wrongdoing, and of a missionary of love. If we do a cell analysis of the eye of each individual, it's going to look the same. However, Emmanuel continues, if you give an instrument to these four different individuals, and I'm gonna use the GPS, I just love that. So if you give a GPS with the instructions, 
and say to these four individuals here, it's an instrument, put this to use. The person who does not know how to read will make no use of that GPS. The person who knows to read but doesn't like to read is almost like not knowing to read will also not know what to do with that. And then there's some of us who will read the instructions and will decide to go with that GPS in different directions. And that is precisely the idea of mediumship. With mediumship, there are two components. There are actually rules that guide the phenomena. And there is an amazing instruction book, an amazing manual that teaches us how to use it safely and in a way that you will become that instrument of redemption generating light in our lives, which is the medium's book. So if you want to practice mediumship in a safe way, and in accordance to the teachings of Jesus, this is the manual. As Daniel says, not an easy one to read, but one that has the instructions, and we must read it in order to practice. And in this manual, we're going to find the loss of mediumship. Of course, I cannot talk to you about the entire book right now. But I thought it would be important to highlight some of the laws that guide the phenomena so that at least we live here today with some ideas on how this works. There are many categories of spirits. This was mentioned earlier today. Many people believe, none of you I know, but Many people outside of here believe that once we pass away, pass on to another realm of life, in a miraculous way, we become better. <laughs> this would be a true miracle. And if we're lucky enough to have a priest that will pray and forgive our sins just before, then even better, we'll be in heaven. But we learn that we are a pale reflection of the other humanity. And if among ourselves we have all kinds of spirits, all kinds of minds, and all kinds of feelings, the spiritual realm is absolutely no different. And so, who are the spirits who are talking to us, who are sending the messages to us? We must be aware that there are many different spirits, and any spirit can come here and sign Abraham Lincoln. Was it really Abraham Lincoln or not? Because the spirits like to play tricks. I know this is a very, very foreign idea for some of us because so many of us have this idea that all oh, spirits are angels. But again, don't we play tricks with one another? And if that's our mindset and how we live our entire lives, once we're in the spiritual realm, we will continue to play tricks with the incarnates on earth. Nothing changed. The law of affinity is the basis of the phenomena. Let me just tell you how this happens very, very quickly. We all have our IDs in our pockets. Some of us don't have IDs in certain countries. But spiritually speaking, we all have IDs. There is no one that's you know, illegal in the spiritual realm. Our IDs are formed by the content of our feelings, of our emotions. They're really what's coloring our thoughts and ultimately becoming actions in our lives. So when the spirits look at you, this is what they see, the content that's within your heart. And that's how they're going to establish the connection. I like what I see in your heart. I identify with those type of feelings and emotions I'm going to be with you. Or I don't like you, I'm going to look for somebody else that likes the same things. That's very easy to understand. We're here together because we like the same thing. 
There is something that brings us together. So this is the basis of the phenomena where we have an identity on our, based on our feelings. We're going to establish affinities. We're going to establish connections. We're going to influence one another. Ideas will be whispered to us. We're going to take those ideas. A lot of times, we will identify that they belong to another mind, but they are in us. So the law of affinity is on the base of the phenomena. The importance of this is this. What is in your heart? Who are your companies? Because we might want to be with the angels, but if we deep inside us, we don't have the feelings that the angels carry in their hearts, we're not going to find the affinity. Communications depend on the will of the spirit. You know when your phone rings and you look at the phone? It's Sandra. I'm not going to answer. <laughs> or it's Sandra from Canada. Oh, sure, I'm going to answer. Right? So we choose who we want to talk to or not. So do the spirits. And the implication with that is this. When we cannot always rely on them talking to us because we don't know whether they actually want to talk to us or not. And depending on our intentions, they may say, no, I, that's not a person that I want to talk to right now. Mediumship can be suspended. I think that's a very uh, important concept as well. And these, again, if it was given to us, it can be taken to, uh, from us as well. So if you're going to rely on mediumship for business, for instance, dangerous road to go. Because you may have it one day and not be there the other day. Same way with the spirits. And that is what creates a lot of room for you know, fraudulent actions and things like that. When you're relying on something for a, a, a purpose Relying on a, on a mind that's foreign to yours. It's something not, that does not belong to you. It's a mind-to-mind, peri-spirit-to-peri-spirit phenomenon. If, you're not, um, if you don't know the word peri-spirit, it refers to the astral body. It refers to the, the body of the spirit. And what is the implication of that? Is that if you're going to communicate with the spirits, you do not need anything else Anything else material, no balls, no cards, no nothing, no, no, no candles. All you need is your mind, your feeling, and your intent for the phenomena to happen. Highly evolved spirits do not submit themselves to the order of the first person. Because, not because they don't, they don't want to help us, but because they are, look at the missionaries on earth. They usually occupy in attending to a great number of people and doing things they're benefiting a large number of persons as opposed to responding to the needs of one individual per se. And different than many believe the highly evolved spirits are not sitting on clouds. They're actually very busy working to keep Harmony, where we are disharmonizing. Okay, so, like I said, the first part is understanding the laws that govern the phenomenon. And the second part is deciding with my GPS, where am I going tonight? Am I going, or today? Am I going to the mediumship conference? Or am I going to the beach? Well, nobody would go to the beach today, it's too cold. But you understand what I mean. So we can utilize mediumship to, for superior purposes to seek the kingdom of heaven within ourselves for the development of the virtues or for inferior mundane purposes. A lot of people seek mediumship for the solution of the earthly problems. In the book Realms of Mediumship, we observe the spirit Hilarius, friend of Andrew Lewis, 
and their mentor Aulus. They are observing a mediumistic session in the spiritual center. And Ilario, that is a very curious and young spirit, poses the question as he observes the medium receiving hundreds of messages in that day. What is the purpose of so many messages being delivered if they don't bring a definitive solution for the problems that these people have in their lives? And the mentor Aulus bring to Ilario a very important concept which is the concept that is found in the entire universe in all realms of life, that is the law of cooperation, where wisdom rescues ignorance and where the more enlightened reaches out to the less enlightened. And this is what the spirits do. They reach out to us. And Ilario, in listening to Aulus, replies by saying, we are accustomed to receiving decisive and absolute solutions to our problems from heaven. And Aulus replies to him that this is a vice of the human mind, of the human mind that does not understand that the problems of life, that the obstacles, the difficulties are actually divine tools for the process of enlightenment. It would be the same thing to ask a professor to answer the test of the student. It would steal from the student the divine and precious opportunity of studying, of putting an effort, of growing, of developing its intelligence and its creativities. So the problems and the challenges of life exist for reason. And to ask the spirits to remove them for us is telling them to keep us ignorant, not knowing, not developing our own capacities. And then he moves forward by saying to Ilario and Andrew Lewis, Jesus aided the sick and the afflicted without removing their fundamental problems. And then he sees Zacchaeus, who was visited by Jesus, the wealthy man received, he was honored by Jesus' visit, but he still had to do his part in the transformation of his feelings. Or Mary of Magdalene, who was also visited by his mercifulness, and he still had to go and do the hard work of self-renewal. Or Lazarus, who was resurrected from the darkness of the tomb but not exonerated later on from dying. Or Saul of Tarsus, who received his message on the road of Damascus, but he still had to move on in a life of sacrifice and effort, doing his own job in his own ascension and his own redemption. It is easier for the common individual to work with equals or subordinates, since working with superiors requires goodwill, discipline, a timely correction of their actions, and a firm desire to improve. So it is, it is so easy to come to the spirit center and say, I want to be with the good spirits. And many, many, many people will leave spiritism because it's not an easy philosophy to follow. Because it's not enough to say, Lord, Lord, to pronounce the name of the Lord, it requires so much work. But I will tell you, it's so worthwhile. It's so worthwhile to put the effort, to use the discipline to stop our tendencies. So many times, so many vices, illusions that we bring in our minds for so many lives, repeating the same behaviors that have given us nothing but suffering. So it takes a lot of work. And most important, the discipline and the hope and the knowledge to know that one day we are able to shift. One day the true miracle does happen if you persevere. It changes, it shifts within you. No doubt about that. But in order to multiply the talents, we also need to do some work. 
We need to understand the purpose and essence. As I have said before, mediumship is not a trade of this world. It was given to us, it's a gift. It's an opportunity for work, for the production of good and love on earth. Horace Greeley, spirit, in the book Among Brothers of Other Lands, he states that free mediumship is one of the greatest contributions of spiritism to this humanity. Study always. I hear so many times some of my friends at the Spirit Center, my brothers and sisters, saying, we already studied the Spirit's book two times. Divaldo Franco, in the book Mediumship with Jesus, he says that, medi that, he says that the Spirit's philosophy is so deep that it will take many lives for us to really, really understand the meaning of it. And some of us may um, ask, did Chico Xavier, Chico Javier, the biggest Brazilian medium, did he study? I had the pleasure of reading this book from Clovis Tavares, Chico Javier, 30 years he spent in a close friendship with Chico. And in the book, in all the times that he meets with Chico, they always, always opening the gospel according to his spiritism and sitting and having the pleasure and the joy of learning, of studying, and of meditating on the teachings of Jesus. And Clovis tells a story where one day he's walking in the streets of Campos, a city in the state of Rio de Janeiro. And they are going to the school of Jesus Christ, one of the spiritual centers of this city. When Chico turns to Clovis and says, Clovis, Emmanuel is here and he's telling me that I should ask you to lend me the book that you're reading about Charles Wagner. Because Emmanuel tells me that I need to know about him. So not only he studied, but Emmanuel was after him, making sure that he read everything that was necessary. And Clovis, when one day he arrived at Chico's house, a little earlier than the time that they had agreed on, Chico is sitting at the balcony of the house, reading. And what was he reading? The Spirit's book. So the spirits tell us, Emmanuel tell us about the need of continuously studying so that we can, through the study, be in tune with the higher spirits and also gather the instruments necessary for the practice of mediumship with Jesus. But the first need of the medium, completing the education of the medium, is to educate himself in the gospel for the work of self-renewal and inner transformation. We stated a little while back that mediumship is based on the law of affinity. So the biggest, biggest work that we invited to do is the transformation of our own hearts. So that by creating an identity of light, we can also connect with light. Emmanuel, in speaking about inner transformation, he states the perfume kept in a crystal vase won't be the same when held in a vase filled with mud. What is in our heart right now? Because even if by the mercy of God and the good spirits, they whisper to us words of love, of encouragement, but our heart is in turmoil, the message won't even get to our spiritual ears. Because there is something in between those angels speaking to us and our ability even to understand and to hear the message. So it's necessary to make our heart into this very calm lagoon. 
where it can be clear so we can hear the message from the spirits. And the instructor Alberio in the book In the Realms of Mediumship, he states in mediumship we cannot overlook the phenomena of synchronization. We attract spirits that have affinity with us and to which we are also attracted. Those that compare our mental world to a mirror are right. We reflect the images around us and we direct towards others the images that we create. And since we cannot escape the imperative of attraction, we shall only present clarity and beauty if they exist in the mirror of our interior life. The mirror buried in the mud does not reflect the splendor of the sun. There is no mediumistic perfection, according to, to the instructor Alberio, without the refinement or the purification of the soul. We must, we must look into ourselves. We must first learn to recognize what is that we are feeling. So that through this work, this practice of awareness, of recognition of our own feelings, of mindfulness, which is the word of the moment, we can then transcend, we can then transform, do this work that will grant us. And we don't need to be perfect because the spirits are forever good and mercifulness and merciful. So whenever the intent and the effort is present, they will come and they will connect with us despite of our limitations. But it's necessary that we engage in this work of self-knowledge and inner transformation that we can truly connect with the higher realms of life. And to reach to this point, Jesus Christ is the reference in two different ways. If we think about renewal, if we think about inner transformation, he is the reference, the highest reference of the virtues on earth. Some of the concepts that he spoke to us over 2,000 years ago are still foreign to our hearts. Love your enemies. What? I'm having a hard time today loving my friends. And from the top of the Christ, Father, forgive them. Because they have no idea what they are doing. There is no higher reference than this. He is the path, he is the light, he is the truth. Not he, the man. Because he is one Christ among so many in the universe. But he was the Christ that came to stay with us. And who taught us, not because he could speak about love, but because he was, he was, completely and entirely, at all times, love. And for this condition, for this position, he was the medium of God on earth. And he used mediumship as an instrument. He was an instrument of God in excellence, utilizing mediumship to enhance his doctrine of love. He was the medium of God because he, has, he had the purity of heart. That is what we all should seek to achieve. Because I'm looking at hundreds of Christs in front of me. So one of the things that the spiritual philosophy teaches us is that we all are Christ in potential. And he came to teach us how to get there. He came us to show the path. When Peter lifts the sword, and cuts the ear of the soldier who came to take Jesus away. He raises his hand and heals the soldier. 
because he not only told us that we should love our enemies, he showed us how to do that. He showed us how to break the cycle of suffering and darkness in our lives so that we one day, just like him, will be able to reflect in our hearts, in our souls, and in our lives the will of the Father who is in heaven. In Chico Xavier, in a letter to Van Twil de Freitas in the book Testimonies of Chico Xavier, and I can almost hear him saying, I can almost hear his voice saying, imagine, my dear Van Twil, if Christ would have charged us for all the blessings that he delivered to us, what would have been of us? And that is such a true question. What would have been of us? So I would like to leave you with this last slide for today. That is a statement made by the spirit Aulus as he ends his work that is described in the book in the realms of mediumship and he's saying goodbye to Andrew Lewis and to Ilario. And he's his, one of his final observations, he says, as an instrument of life, mediumship appears everywhere. The farmer is the medium of the harvest. The plant is the medium of the fruit, and the flower is the medium of the perfume. The invitation that Jesus, the biggest medium of all times, because what he did was powerful. He walked over the water. He multiplied the bread. He transformed water into wine. He healed the sick. He spoke to spirits and asked them to leave. He was the biggest medium. And what he did was he spread love. He was the perfume. He was the flower, his message, the perfume, and the invitation that the spiritist doctrine, the spirit philosophy leaves to each one of you is that you too can be a medium of perfume and a medium of love by using your mediumship, whether it's an ostensive mediumship, whether it's your intuition. Each one of you are walking around under the influence of the spirits. And at each moment of your life, you are invited to make a decision to choose to hear one of these voices that speak within you. Which voice are you paying attention to? The voices of illusion or the voice that calls you for the transformation and for the living of a different paradigm of life. This is the invitation. Because it's not for only for the ones who are the so-called mediums because they have the ostensive mediumship is to each one of you. It's a sense that lies in you. Some of you more dormant than others, but it is in you. And if you choose to develop, you can do it. The spiritual center is the place, the safe place, where there we try to mimic precisely the way in which Jesus used his mediumship by speaking to his spirits who are suffering, who are in need of love. Most of the time we don't speak to angels. Do you know why? Because we're so far away from them. But we speak to those who identify with us in the same struggles that we have, in the same darkness that we carry inside, following the law of cooperation of one reaches out to the hand of the other in need, and by helping each other, we start to create a positive karma in our lives, and we start to create and to pave the path of our own redemption. So I thank you very much for this opportunity, and I hope that this message has reached your hearts with the same depth and the same strength that it has reached mine. Thank you.